just exalt your name. God, we just come in this place just to meet with you, God. We just long for more of your presence, Lord. We just want to sit in your presence, God. And we just pray, God, that you would just blow in this place. God, let Pastor Renee's words be your words to all of us, Lord. Just speak through her, God, to each and every one of us. And God, please open our hearts to be able to hear what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears throat> How many of you, that would be your confession this morning, that you would exalt God? I will exalt you, O oh God. That you would make that confession that you would exalt him. I think sometimes we don't really think about the words that we say, um, what it means to exalt God. And that really means that you want to put God above you. Put God above what you're thinking this morning, above your agendas, your thoughts, your attitudes, your opinions. Americans are the most opinionated people. You ever notice that? We just think we got it all. So I just, I want us to exalt God right now. I want us to exalt Him, which means, that means we need to, you know, uh, John the Baptist used to pray that, because everybody loved John the Baptist. That's why when he died, it was so tragic for so many, because he had so many followers. But John the Baptist used to pray that he would decrease so that God could increase. See, we want to say, hey God, meet me right here. And God says, no, I want to be exalted. I need to be above you. So I just encourage you to enter into this time of hearing the word. We're going to have a special presentation from some of our children who are very anxious to come up and do something for us. They were supposed to do it last night. We weren't um, totally, we weren't completely ready. But um, they're going to come up. And uh, if we've got the CD ready, almost, not yet, but in a little bit. Do you need the CD first? I have it. No, they don't need it yet, so. So why don't you guys come up? Can we give a big hand to these kids who are brave enough to exalt God? Go ahead, come on up. You can come up. Or are you waiting for Grandma to tell you it's okay? Jesus is for all Jesus is for all.
So let's, let's um, I'm going to try to bring home a little bit of last night. Not all of you got to be here last night. And so you missed out on um, some of the things that we talked about with where the church is going in the ministry center. And we're going to look at that. And um, But before we do that, I want to bring the attention to the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit for quite a few weeks now. And the Holy Spirit, you know, the, the songs that they were singing this morning, exalting the name of Christ, that we are the church, we are his sons and daughters, that the church is what's alive and well in our world today. Uh, this is God. This is where God makes himself known is in the church with a capital C meaning in the lives of the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, those of us that confess Jesus Christ, those of us that are followers of Jesus Christ, we are the ones that are the church with a capital C. We are the body of Christ. And so we are the church uh, of Jesus Christ here in this world today. And the only way that we're able to do that is through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what's alive and well and moving in our world today. I've told you for several weeks now as we've been going over this that of the three manifestations of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit gets the least amount of attention. He is the one manifestation that we all take for granted, that we don't think that we really need to obey or submit to. But the Holy Spirit is literally the spirit of the living God in our world today residing and alive in believers of Jesus Christ. That's the simplest way of explaining what the Holy Spirit is. And as if you and I are not using that spirit, then the world is going to think that the spirit of God is dead. Because he doesn't see the life of God in this world today. So um, God told Ezekiel, Ezekiel was a prophet. Um, God told Ezekiel to speak his truth, to prophesy to his people about Israel, to, to speak to his people Israel about this new life. You have to understand that God's people at this time were in captivity. Captivity that God allowed to happen. It's kind of like the biggest timeout you've ever seen. You know, you parents, when your kids aren't obeying, you separate them and you discipline them, right? You punish them so that until they learn to obey. God's people, God's children, struggled, and still to this day, struggle with obedience. And so God had to put them on time out, so to speak. God is absolutely sovereign, almighty God. He has control over all. Uh, he is the one that gave life, and he is the one that will take life. So God allowed the, the enemies of his children, of Israel, the nation of Israel, his people, he allowed other nations to conquer them. He allowed that. If he didn't want it to happen, it wouldn't happen. But because he's sovereign and all-powerful and almighty, he can do that, and he did. And he did that to say, okay, since you can't seem to listen to my rules, here's what I'm going to do. Now you're going to be in, in captivity to the Babylonians or the Assyrians, whichever ones at whichever times. So they were back under bondage and had to live that way. And of course, just like your child doesn't like to be on time out, God's people didn't like to be on time out. Well, God spoke to Ezekiel and he said, speak this truth to my people about the new life that he was going to give them. And so he is speaking to them and telling him what he's going to do. And so I want you to tell them, say to them that this is what their sovereign Lord says. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things. So I stopped there. I didn't finish the verse, but I'm going to in a minute. Because I wanted to stop there and go... What things? What things is he going to do? Because if you back up, and I'm not going to, but I'll paraphrase it for you, but if you're interested, look up Ezekiel 35, 36, 37, and you will see this conversation. But God spoke to these people, and he was telling them, here's what I'm going to do. Even though you have made my name a mockery, you've made people look at me and go, huh, you guys are powerless. You guys are, what kind of God do you have? And here you are in captivity. You don't have no control. You don't have no dominion. You've been reduced to nothing. Where is your great God? 
So in the midst of this, they're, they're, they're um, mocking their God. And so God tells them, if you back up and you look, he actually tells them, I am going to bring you back to the land where I am king of your life. Meaning, I'm going to bring life to you. He tells him that I am going to provide in abundance grains and offerings. I'm going to give you more provisions than you know what to do with. I will be, again, your God. And I will do all these things. I will raise up. I will bring people. Because now, God's people scattered. Isn't that what we do in the church? You know, you get upset, you get offended. Welcome to church, right? Boom, boom, boom. People leave. Okay? We scatter. And that's what happened to God's people when they were taken into captivity. You know, when you lose hope, you start just looking in all the wrong places for it. And so they're just kind of everywhere. And God says, I'm going to bring you back together. I'm going to unify you. I'm going to raise up leaders who are going to empower you and equip you and encourage you. I'm just giving you a picture of what I'm going to do. He goes on later to say, and you know this verse if you've been here the last couple weeks. He says, I'm going to put my spirit in you. Not only is he going to meet their physical needs. Not only is he going to provide them leadership and wisdom and direction and, and how to live in this place we call the world. Not only is he going to do that. He says, but even better than that, I'm going to give you me in spirit form to be put in you. And I'm going to move you. My spirit in you will move you to obey. It will move you to follow me. I know you guys always say you want to follow me. I want to follow God. I want to follow God. And God goes, you know, I know your, I know your intentions are well, but your flesh is weak. And I know that. Because I created you. And I know because of that sin nature in you that's constantly at a battle to want to be God and not follow me and want to be your own God and not follow me. I get it. I know it better than you do. And I know better than you do that you're incapable of, of following and committing to me without my spirit in you to move you. It's impossible to please God without God. You just can't do it. A lot of us want to please God on our own merit, on our own ability, so that we can please him. And it just doesn't work that way without him. So he says, I'm going to give you all these things. So that is. And so then the question is, why is God, the sovereign Lord, going to do this? Why is God, in the midst of them, had they started obeying? Well, they were obeying because they had to, in a sense. You know, when you put a child on timeout, they stop doing that, right? Even if you have to tie them there, right? Or duct tape them to the wall. They stop doing it, right? So why? Why was he going to do this? Why was God going to go back and restore them? Was it because he loves them? Was it because that they deserved it, you know? They, they had that sad face long enough, you know? They've been suffering so long, those poor little Israelites. You know how you are, Mom. <coughs> Your kid is driving you nuts, you want to kill him. All right, then you put them on timeout in anger. That's it. I'm done. Had it up you. And then they're like, <laughs> you know that face. My grandson has it. It's like, oh, look at that. And then after a while, I was like, okay, it's okay. It's okay. Now I feel sorry for you. Right? Was it that? Was it the God was like, oh, look at you guys are pathetic. I feel so sorry for you. You've been suffering so long, and it's not your fault. I'm pretty sure he didn't say that. Is it because he created us? Well, does God love us? Yes. Does he feel sorry for us? Yes. Are we his creation? Yes. But it's not exactly. So let's look at that whole verse. It is not for your sake, people of Israel, that I'm going to do these things but for the sake of my holy name, which you have profaned among the nations where you have gone. Do you know what profane means? It really means to show contempt, um, to, to disregard, to disrespect. There's a lot of ways you can look at this. But here these people, Israel, were in the world. God placed us in the world. He created man to be in his image. You know, we wanted to go be our own God, then he created this plan to create uh, a people unto himself who would be his people, who would be the picture of who God is. Come on, guys. We don't do so well at that. God's people didn't do so well at that. 
the, the fact is, is that they were making a mockery. Uh, the other people were looking at you, prof profaning us among the nations where you have gone. He says, I will show the holiness of my great name, which has been profaned among the nations. Meaning, there's that picture of the nations really mocking the Israelites. The name you have profaned among them. Then the nations, once I get through doing this, they will know that I am the sovereign Lord. And I will be proved holy through you before their eyes. One of the things that the Holy Spirit does, and I really want you to listen to this because this is the, this is the battle as a, as a pastor in a church, as somebody who proclaims truth over and over. Um, the one truth is always very simply that if we could just get more than anything is for us to die and for God to live. For us to die and for God to live. For us to die and for God to live. That means your attitude, your opinions, your thoughts, your, all those things that are so exalted needs to be crucified with Christ. In the life we live, we live by faith in the Son of God who's exalted on high. And now if we could just master that, you don't need anything else. If you just live according to that. But one of the things that the Holy Spirit does in us as he comes into our life is he makes our life about God and not us. That's really what he says. He's not coming along to say, hey, do you need help? I'll be your co-pilot. Hey, if you want, just when you need something, you know, no big deal, no pressure. Just, you know, if you kind of keep messing things up, just come talk to me. I'm here for you. Um, I won't be pushy. You know, I just, I just feel this little presence. You keep me in the closet because I know sometimes I make people uncomfortable. So, you know, you, know, you don't have to show me off to people. That's not who the Holy Spirit is. The Holy Spirit is in there to go to push out our pride. To push out our sin nature and allow the Spirit of God. You know, we have that sin nature in us and we have that Spirit of God when it comes in. And the question is, which one are you feeding? Because whichever one you're feeding is bigger. Right? If you have two animals, I have two animals. If I feed one more than the other, the one's going to get fatter. It's just, you know, logic. Same thing with your sin nature in you and your spirit nature. They're in conflict with each other. And we want to try to feed both of them. But we can't. So the Holy Spirit is there to remind us about God and not us. He removes our heart of self-centeredness. If you look at that Ezekiel, he goes on to say, I'm going to remove that heart of stone. And I'm going to put in this heart of flesh. I'm going to put something in that I can mold and shape and direct. And be God over. Um, he removes that heart of self-centeredness. And he places his Holy Spirit in his heart within us, continuing to remind us of God's holy name. You know, it's really difficult because we always want to make it about us. It's in our nature to do that. God's plan to restore a lost and dying world back to him is to place himself in creation. God has done that from the beginning, and he's still doing that. God has always brought light where there is no light. Look at the very first two verses in the Bible. First three verses, right? In the beginning, God looked and saw nothing. He saw a void, a darkness. And so what does he do? What's the very first thing he does? Let there be light. Let there be light. It's a very, and do you know he's been putting light in darkness ever since? If you ever want to kind of uh, go on to Bible Gateway or one of those Bible um, online Bibles, put in like the NIV Bible, do a keyword search, put in light, exact word, light, for the whole Bible. And it's over 200 times that the word light is in the Bible. Because the light continues to shine in the darkness. And darkness is very simply a, an absence of light. And some of us are still living in spiritual darkness, meaning we have an absence of God in our life. God has continued to put himself into the darkness throughout time. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And interesting, in John 9, it says that while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. While I am in the world, 
Uh, and he even says, seek the light while you may, seek me while I can be found while I'm here with you. We're talking about the physical Son of God in the flesh, the incarnate God. He's saying that while I'm here, there is light in the world. Well, we could just take that scripture and go, well, that's kind of sad because we know that he leaves the world. We know that he ascends back to heaven. So the physical incarnate Christ that we know of in the Bible and the Gospels is not physically present here today. However, we do know that in many ways the incarnate God is most definitely here today. You're breathing, right? I hope. You have flesh, yes? You talk, you walk, you touch, you feel, you smell. We are, when we ask Christ to come and dwell in us, that Holy Spirit, we become the light in the world. Jesus said, after resurrecting from death, defeating death for us, he literally commissions us to be his light in the world. He commissions us. He sends us out to now be that light. In Matthew, we see that he says that we are the light of the world. And it's really, you know, we have to be careful with that phrase, like, well, I'm the light of the world. Check it out. Okay. I'm, it's God in me that shines out. So if I'm constantly covering up that Holy Spirit, if I'm hiding the Holy Spirit in the closet, if he's making me uncomfortable and I don't want to obey him and he's